Hello everyone and welcome back to season 3 of the Fan Fiction Tapes. I'm your host today, Maya, pronouns she, her, and today I am joined by... Hi, it's Cam, I'm back. Did you miss me? That, that was really silly, but hi, I'm back. Happy to be back. <laughs> hi, back, I'm dad. Stop, I knew you were going to do that the second that I said it. I was like, oh, Maya's going to do it, and there you go, you did it. Uh, and I am our producer, Ian. Oh, right. My pronouns are she, they, or whatever. I forgot about that. Might be. <laughs> All good, bestie. Today, the Allegedly Fan Fiction podcast actually talks about fan fiction. That's going to kind of be a theme here with the next month-ish of episodes. Today's theme, AUs. Woo. And uh, for those of you who haven't had your brain rotted, you might be wondering what the fuck I'm on about. <laughs> And AU is abbreviation of alternate universe. It is a term for a specific type of fan fiction where things aren't quite the way they go in canon. In fact, our uh, title note that we have written down is that's not how it happened. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> if you get it, you get it. If not, read the locked tomb. Thank you. Yeah, that that should be the tagline of the this entire podcast. I know this entire podcast. I feel like, but a good chunk of it. Basically, every other episode. Yeah, we're all very normal here. Uh, yeah, they, these are pretty common in fandom spaces. Uh, and they vary from things like, okay, but what if things went slightly differently? To, wouldn't it be fucked up if this happened? <laughs> So I wanted to bring up a couple of types of AUs, and I'm actually going to go out of the order that I wrote them in because that was the order I thought of things. Canon divergence was what I wanted to start off with. Um, and there's, I have noted them as minor and major because canon divergence AUs are, I, I think they're probably one of the more common types, but that is also purely anecdotal data. And it's where... As the name implies, there is some divergence from the canon or what happens in the show. Uh, maybe an event turns out slightly differently. Instead of staying silent or tripping over their own feet, a character confesses their feelings to someone else. Or something similar. But there's also ones where the canon divergence is much bigger. What if these two characters that were, as far as we see them, always enemies actually friends originally what if this character wasn't born to these parents and this type of thing actually covers a broad sweep of things that are uh often kind of slightly delineated under their own things such as power swap AUs well i um i re i requested to be on this episode because a very good chunk of most of what i write could be classified as AU and one of the longest projects that I ever undertook fanfic writing wise was a canon divergent sort of AU. This would be the really long arcane fanfic that I still haven't finished because it got really popular and that scared me. But anyway, I relatable. It was horrifying. And I feel bad because I'm still getting comments on people like, you ever going to finish this? It's been more than a year, except like nicer. And I'm like, yeah, bestie, I'm waiting for everyone to forget about it so that I could go back to it and not feel like, you know, oh, dear, people are going to remember this and then it's going to blow up again. And I don't like it when things get too popular. Don't ask me how I'll behave if I ever become like a published author of like books. It's not it's going to be interesting, but I digress. Um, One of the I was trying to think as I was going into this episode about what it is about canon divergent AUs that compelled me, because obviously every fanfic reader and every fanfic writer is different, but I think for me the thing that's so compelling is, and I come at this obviously from like the perspective of someone who reads and writes a lot for fun and also writes like speculative fiction, so I'm very good at thinking about all of the what-ifs of all of the ways things could go terribly wrong or whatever, but Canon, canon divergent AUs and ca canon related AUs where something is quite somewhat different or one thing changed, it's really fun to consider what 
the one difference or that one change, like the implications that that has on the broader story, or at least that was the fun that I was having with my um, arcane fic, um, which if you've never seen arcane, first of all, please fix that before November, 2024, when the second season drops. Second of all, um, the premise of the fic was what if two characters had met when they were, um, young people instead of when they were whole adults and met when they actually did in canon and how that would, uh, alter the course of many events, many other characters' trajectories and so on. And thinking about all of those different changes and all of the different, um, you know, kind of like timeline alterations, I guess, was really fun and a good part of what kept me coming back to the story. Um, so like as a writer and a reader, that's what I vibe with um, in terms of canon divergence, I guess. Um, and I'm sure there will be a Harrow the Ninth rant unleashed, but that will not be for me this time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I'm also the same. I'm a big uh, AU and canon divergence reader. I think I've only written one fic that was not an AU. At least not explicitly an AU. And ironically enough, it was the gift fic that I wrote for you. <laughs> Which was such a nice fic. It was so touching. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. That was, um, <laughs> I, I sent one of our mutual friends, I think you can guess who, uh, yep. A message after you helped me out. I was like, okay, well, I got I to gotta get Cam a gift. Help. And that, that was first thing out of their mouth. Yeah, that tracks. <laughs> what do they say? My brand, it is airtight. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I got three moves. That's it. It was very sweet. Very, very lucky to have people in my life who know me that well. We are 11 minutes into even just the recording, not even the episode, and we're already <laughs> off track. <laughs> well, that happens. ADHD talking hour, folks. Just wait until you get me into the portion where we talk about other kinds of AUs, because I just went on a whole tirade about that to my mother, so I am locked and loaded. Oh, boy. Tirade is the wrong word. It's tirade positive. I just don't know what... It was very impassioned rant, shall we say. Because yes, dear listeners, my mother is very well-versed in the lingo of fanfiction. She knows what an AU is. She knows what AO3 is. She knows what tags are. Explaining dead dove do not eat to her was a whole experience, but I have done that. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. She's great. Thank goodness she never will be able to find my AO3, but she doesn't care. She just reads the fic that I print out for her off of Microsoft Word. <laughs> I, we oh, do yeah. need to have a tagging episode at some point. Ah, uh, tagging. That does actually quasi-segue after I derailed the segue to something else I want to talk about. Uh, no, two more types of AUs, uh, fusions and crossovers, and... These words are sometimes used interchangeably. As I understand it, they're slightly different, but I'm actually fairly new to fandom, much newer than the two of you. Yeah, now I'm just remembering that I have in fact been in fandom for over half my life. Horrifying. If it helps, I've been, it f been in it for about a quarter of my life. Welcome. Your time is only beginning. Soon you'll be sucked in here right along with me forever and ever. Just kidding, I don't uh, mind at all. I, I think I'm already a little sucked in. Yeah. We don't suffer from fandom derangement. We enjoy every minute of it. Exactly. You understand me. There could be a little suffering as a treat. I love, as you both know, I love suffering. I love suffering. To, in the tone of, I love mess. Sometimes the two both exist in the same fic, actually. There's a lot of mess in fanfic. So much. I really can't speak on um, crossover AUs and whatnot, because I will admit they're actually not my cup of tea, so I will proverbially yield the floor to y'all. <laughs> Nian, do you have input, or am I going to have to uh, freewheel this? Well, like you mentioned, um, I'm pretty sure that fusion and crossover are D similar but distinct but also i'm also going off of vibes off of what the difference between them is the way that i understand the difference is that 
crossover is when you take characters from one uh, franchise and come up with some excuse to put them in the setting of a different franchise where they can interact with the characters there in that setting. And usually there's some hand-wavy plot excuse for transplanting them tempor on a possibly on a temporary basis or possibly on a longer basis depending on the plot whereas a fusion doesn't have that transitional part of the plot you just take the two settings and stick them in a blender yeah i was gonna say i, I thought it was always yeah more of a, kind of a blender of where you end up with like kind of a mix sometimes you actually take two characters stick them in a blender and uh i was gonna say pour them out into a mold but that makes a that doesn't make much sense for anything you'd be blending i mean if you're making popsicles <laughs> fair i am noting in my mind here that while we have been talking about this in like fan fiction terms and we have introduce this as a fan fiction focused episode i can think of a few published traditional media things that would probably qualify as au's no mentioning the justice league ruby thing cam hasn't seen ruby yet this is starting next month by the way your wait is almost over for the like oh. seven people <laughs> dying for it yes I wasn't going to mention anything more than, than the premise of it. If it helps, I'll probably forget. I'm studying for a certification exam right now, so I'll forget you, whatever you're saying, because my brain is full of certification exam nonsense, so you're, you're probably safe. I don't want Emmy to murder me. Yeah, I, I'm not going to mention anything <laughs> other than the fact that it is a cross official pair of crossover movies between Ruby and... DC Comics. Uh, Jay, one of our previous guests, has actually mentioned that it's pretty good, apparently. I've kind of heard that from multiple people. I think a few people on, this, on the Crow's Nest have actually said that it's good. Yeah, okay, but they're in the Crow's Nest. I don't really trust their taste. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Ooh. I mean, we're also in the Crow's Nest. I have no skin nest, in this game. So. <laughs> <laughs> what were you doing... <laughs> At the Devil's Sacrament, Maya. Exactly. <laughs> but no, the other thing I'm thinking of is um, Marvel's What If series. Those I would qualify under canon divergence and what I have marked in the script as blank spot AUs because the blank spot there is replaced by some other word that's like, you know, spy or mortal or modern or modern with power is my favorite modern au is my beloved so on that note shall we segue into talking about uh blank type au's yeah because i forgot where i was going with uh that statement i i, I think that none of us really know much about fusions and crossovers other than the vibes yeah i I don't read much crossover stuff. I, I've written some, um, mainly crossovers between She-Ra and Destiny, because I'm a very normal human being, and Arcane, and a variety of things. So I did some digging while y'all were talking, because I was curious, and the, the uh, TV tropes conclusion seems to be that a fusion... Fic is a variety of crossover fic where two or more works are merged together into one hopefully cohesive setting, whereas a crossover fic is when the worlds are not merged and are clearly two separate things and just cross over somehow, usually through like an AU premise. So, uh, yeah. So for whatever that's worth, there you go. <laughs> I, I, I think that kind of lines up with the, with the vibes I was, I was getting off of that. Yay! Okay. Vibes. We run off vibes here. So true, bestie. Except when we don't. 
<laughs> so the uh, the blank type A use. And this is honestly almost a catch all for the ones that don't fit the previous categories we've mentioned. I'm trying to really quickly grab one up oh, modern AU, modern with powers, which I mentioned is my personal favorite, magic AUs, etc., etc. Oh, and and superheroes. That that that's a classic one. You could you could probably call these all canon divergence major, except for the fact that there is such an uh, extreme degree of divergence. It's it's an extreme degree of divergence centered around some concept that's more like I guess fundamental. Like, what if everyone instead grew up in um, 13th century Britain, for example? Or what if all these characters from uh, a show that is set in ostensibly not now instead? have to deal with the horrors of college. I see a lot of uh, modern AU fan work for uh, Stormlight Archive on my dash for some reason. That makes sense. I love a good modern AU. Um, like, especially the, the subgenres of, like, you know, coffee shop AUs or college AUs. Those tend to be... Um, if I'm going to write an AU, what I do, um, particularly because I enjoy the challenge of finding a premise that is realistic to the characters. Um, I will not unleash the entire rant if you don't want me to. Um, but the rant is why we have you. Awesome. Great. So one of the reasons why, since I was very young fanfic author, I liked writing AUs was because I always had a list first in my head. And then out of my head and in a notes app document now, um, I have a list of like AUs that I would love to explore. However, those AUs require a very specific type of character or type of origin story. Because for me, part of the fun of writing AUs that are like, you know, modern AU or whatever is transposing the characters with their angst, trauma, backstories and all into a modern setting, which I find is at least my key to keeping them feeling like in character, like they are the same characters that we met in the source material. Um, they've just been transplanted into this uh, universe. And so um, this often means that I have AU ideas that are just like sitting on my mental shelf, so to speak, waiting for the right story to come along, the right source material and characters to feel like they were a good fit for the fic that I want to write. And then when that inevitably happens, it's great. Um, as an example, I don't know why I can only think of my like arcane fix right now, but here we go. Um, I realized that despite who I am as a person, I had never written a post-apocalyptic AU fanfic before, um, which is very I odd. I can't believe this. That That's never before arcane. Yeah, I was surprised as well. And so when I did, um, I needed the right characters to come around and the right characters came around in the form of the characters from arcane. And because they had the right skill sets and backstories and personalities and all this stuff in canon, it was really easy to transpose all of that into my kind of AU universe and make it feel believable, make it feel in character, make it feel like it actually made sense. And that was part of the challenge and it's part of the fun for me because I found that when I try to force it when writing AUs, if I try to put characters in a situation trademark sign that they're not meant for, it feels like trying to jam a shoe on the wrong foot and I, the, the story just doesn't go. And that's how I write AUs that are in character. And I don't know if they are or not. I just know that people who leave comments tell me that it's incredibly in character. So I just kind of take it and freaking run with it. It's the same thing with like the other iteration of the AU that I forgot about until just now, like post-canon speculative AUs are other ones that I like. Ooh. I somehow wrote a blacked out and wrote like a 16,000 word, nine chapter long locked tomb post-canon AU. Um, oh yeah, once. that was a banger. Oh, thank you. I, I felt bad because I was, it was supposed to be a short fic and then it just kept going. And then I sent it to, my friend with a, a, a plea to, hi, I know that you said you would, you know, edit this, so can you please, but also it's the day before Christmas Eve, so no pressure. Um, 
Actually, I believe what I sent them first was, how much do you love me and is it enough to edit this with a screenshot of the word count? And their response was something akin to, are you insane? But they did it. And it's the same sort of vibe of like, if you know these characters well enough and you, you can thus predict how they're going to behave in the future, you can imagine canon around them. And then with the modern AUs, my fun is kind of, you know, adjacent to that, which is, you know, taking these characters and everything that they are in canon and then transposing that uh, into the fanfic and making it make sense. And this looks like um, a lot of different things for me. There's a, a, a fic that I'm writing right now on a burner AO3 count for reasons that will take too long to get into, but sometimes I just like to be anonymous. But um, it's essentially a coffee shop AU, but the but the premise is made more interesting by the fact that, you know, and it's all, it's a very shippy fic because I like ships. And, and so person A in the ship, so in canon, person A and person B of this ship met uh, as young people during a very traumatic event. In canon, both of them remember this happened and they bond over it. They, they, they form a very close bond because of this traumatic event. However, in the coffee shop AU, person A does not remember person B. And so she just walks into the coffee shop one day and person B who works at said shop is like stunned that all these years later, because they're like college age at the time, um, all these years later, there she is. And what do you mean you don't remember me? This is really weird. And so playing with little elements like that is fun. And anyway, there's thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> it's kind of funny. This actually happened to two of my friends. What? They met when they were really young. Bruh. Ended up um, falling out of contact with each other. Met again in high school. Became friends. One of them remembered this the whole time. The other one had no idea. Wow, that's crazy. Uh, which was deeply entertaining to me when uh, this is mentioned in conversation. I don't even remember how that came up uh, originally. Wild. That's Probably crazy. something about memory, um, yeah. if I had to guess. And you mentioned a lot that you like how kind of the characters taking their characterization, how that's required for certain to use their backstories. And I take a similar but slightly different approach of there's, you know, certain, uh, well, to borrow terms from a certain movie, there are certain canon events, if you will. I still haven't seen that movie. I need to get on that. Yes. Um, th <laughs> that shape a character's story, their personality. Let's use the obvious example of Peter Parker. He gets beat, bitten by a radioactive spider. His uncle Ben dies. Police captain close to him, or someone related to him, dies. These events are basically happen for, like, every Spider-Man. Th these are identifying things of Spider-Man. So if you take Peter Parker and you stick him in 16th century Germany, similar events are required to happen. And because they shape they shape who he is. And I kind of take some of that, but I also take, well, if, for example, Peter Parker grew up in 16th century Germany, he'd be a little bit different from the Peter Parker that we know that grew up in Queens. And I, I take kind of some so, something I do is specifically the world they're in informs the way they react to the events they've lived. Just a little bit of a different take on something similar. I always find it fun to, like, explore, like, what impact the canon events would have. Like, I don't know, in every AU universe I've ever written, like, going back to Arcane, um, I guess if you haven't seen Arcane Season 1 by now, don't listen to the next, like, 30 seconds of what I'm about to say. I don't know. Um, but, you know, in every, in every universe of every AU I write... Um, Vi and Jinx are always going to have had some sort of issue that led to the wonderfully concerning sibling relationship we see before us in canon. Maybe not that nuclear, maybe not that lethal or volatile, but like it's always going to be there. Um, because some canon events, like you said, they should remain untouched because without them, the, the character wouldn't be the character. And that's part of the fun. Also, the angst potential. It's great. For me. Right. Not if you don't like angst, but I, I love angst, so... We know this. You all have been here long <laughs> enough to know this. Yeah. I mean, for me, the big one is... Um, and you... I don't believe you've seen Chira, and that's where, like, half of my fan fiction is. Um, the two main characters there 
to like canon events for them. Super fucking traumatic childhoods. Awesome. I mean, it's it, it's the classic. While it's more common for those characters to have known each other since childhood and have had the same abusive figure, that's not as set in stone as. Yeah, their childhoods sucked with a capital S and a TM at the end. Yeah, I don't know where I was going. If I was building something, I have forgotten it. I wonder... Is it time to get out the Hair of the Ninth soapbox? <laughs> Do it. So speaking of AUs in canon works, or published works, rather than fan fiction... I love how that's um, all the encouragement you needed. <laughs> I feel like, okay, here's the thing. I feel like, given this laughter, I think that Ian's been sitting on this. Uh, Ian's about to become that one, like, TikTok audio that was like, I've been waiting for this one. Turn it up. That's Ian right now. Okay, so. <laughs> so I, I just got up and got my fancy copy of Harrow for this, by the way. No, my word. Uh-huh, uh-huh. uh-huh. <laughs> I am going to be forever amused by the fact that Tamsin Muir made a way to work writing AUs of her own book mm-hmm. into the sequel to said book. Spoilers for Locked Tomb. In general, well, mainly the first two books, but in general. So, Dad, if you're here, stop. Have you read the latest book recently? <laughs> I don't think he's read none in yet. In Gideon the Ninth, uh, the ostensible goal for the necromancers that are called the Canaan House is to figure out how to become a lictor and join their god, the Emperor Undying, as his new right-hand servants. They find out that the truth of becoming a lictor means that you have to kill and consume the soul of another person. Traditionally, this has been the Necromancer's Cavalier, making them... There's also usually, like, a little bit of um, cannibalism involved. Yes. Mm -hmm. And traditionally, the Cavalier has been one of the closest people uh, to said necromancer. Um, Usually, like, the closest person. Yeah. Uh, In in the case of uh, the Fifth House, um, they're literally married. And at the end of Gideon the Ninth, Gideon sacrifices herself so that Harrow can become a lictor uh, and defeat is it Kitheria? Is that how that's pronounced? That's how I'm going to pronounce it, Kitheria. I think that's how it's pronounced. Cause really the only thing that can stand up to another lictor is a lictor. In Harrow the Ninth, it is eventually revealed that Harrow did not take this well at all. I mean, the the last scenes of Harrow's, Harrow's pretty distraught in the last section of, of getting the ninth. Just a little. Just a little. All of these are such understatements. Uh-huh. And considering that Harrow the Ninth is... About half of it is written in second-person perspective. Which, God, that was such an adjustment. That actually, that made me set the book down at first. It's, it's a trip. It doesn't quite immediately pick up from the end of Gideon the Ninth. There's some time skip involved. And so it's narrated as though the reader is Harrow. Except that what is being described doesn't quite seem to follow on logically from what happened in Gideon the Ninth. And eventually we find out that Harrow in an attempt to preserve some portion of Gideon's individuality, 
gave herself a lobotomy so that she can no longer remember Gideon at all. Just normal behaviors, clearly. Yeah. And this has some side effects where her, uh, her, her brain is trying to create new memories that don't have Gideon in them at all. And so we get these dream sequences every other chapter that are retelling Gideon the Ninth without Gideon. And as things break down, these scenarios get more and more outlandish until finally Harrow remembers Gideon and breaks down over it. Just a little bit. Okay, so most of these AU flashbacks are like a continuous retelling of Gideon the Ninth with no Gideon. But when that breaks down, then we start to get these insert blank AUs. There's Cam, you might you might have to help me remember how many there are because the coffee shop one always cracks me up. And <laughs> There's three. I have, I have, there's three. There, there's Nova, Royal, and uh, Fairy Star. Yeah, okay, so there yeah, are three, you're three. right. Yes, yeah. thanks. Thank you. How did I, I'm stunned that I remembered that. I guess I really am just an endless font of locked tomb knowledge. Okay, look, oh, I'm... Geez. <laughs> I think the, the Berry Star pun in the coffee shop one, uh, uh, broke me a little bit yeah i almost threw my book across the room <laughs> wait hold up where's where's the pun that i evidently missed on my last you, couple of reads you didn't you didn't catch that well either i did and i'm not like putting two and two together because i'm an idiot or i didn't because i'm an idiot hold up i need to grab my copy okay Oh, man. I just accidentally opened the book to deosipate. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> Closing the book now. Um, That's so smart of you. So this was in the coffee shop, AU. This is the first one where Isaac and Jean-Marie show up. Uh, which page? <laughs> I cannot give you accurate page numbers because, again, I have an ebook. It automatically... Um, Renumbered uh, pages based on, you know, yeah, how much is being displayed on the screen at any given time. Yep. It's in chapter 42. Okay, chapter 42. Wow, that's way later than where I was looking. A strange ripple passed over the younger girl's face as though she were trying very badly not to laugh. But she said, it's not like anything you get back at home. It's got extra stimulants and things like acids for space exposure. Bioadaptive. Can you tell me what it is, Isaac? He screwed up his <laughs> narrow eyes, sighed a little, and then supplied <sighs> bioadaptive reuptake inhibitors. And what do we call it? Berry, he said. B A R I. Yeah, berry. It makes the coffee taste weird, but if you make it the right way with like spices and stuff, it's actually great. The cohort wouldn't run without it, the on duty coffee adepts. We wanted to try this Dex cafeteria because they've got a hot shot new Berry Star. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay, so that that is just the the Berry Star being pun about barista. There uh -huh. we go. And yeah. I I didn't think you were referring to that. Oh, oh no, it's that pun broke me a little. Mm -hmm. Weak. Wow. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> so. We were giggling a little bit over the um, the title of this episode. It is a reference to Harrow. Sure is. A lot of these dream sequences would end with Abigail Pent going, this is not how it happened. Or some variant on that phrase. All right. I yield my time. <laughs> if anybody else would like to get on the soapbox. I honestly, I really like the Harrow Nova one. I, 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 I remember... <laughs> Finishing Harrow going, I need more Harrow Nova content, and then being, like, incredibly disappointed, because I think I... 
I came to the fandom before the Harrow paperback was out, because my original copy of Harrow, I believe, was a hardback. Actually, I can I can search in my photos and find that, because I remember, I remember a friend of mine going, yo, these books slap, and then checking it out, and so then I sent said friend the book haul when I went to go get books. Because, you know, you, even if you go to buy two specific books, you can't just buy two books. No, of course not. It's like guinea pigs. Two is not enough. <laughs> they get lonely. <laughs> Fascinating. Uh, wow. November 21, I'm seeing a photo of Gideon. I got them at the same time, so around then. Huh, that says August of 2020 was when How the Ninth came out, so okay. Anywho, I... The reason I brought this all up was I recalled being very disappointed when there was no, or there, there was a little bit, there, there was not very much uh, Hero Nova content on AO3 yet. Mm -hmm. There might be more since I looked, because it's, it's kind of been a while since I did my Locked Tomb deep dive into, words are failing me, the Locked Tomb. I personally think that Tamsin should win at least one award for actually pulling off the successful introduction of AUs of her own work in her own canon work. That was uh -huh. deeply amusing. It really, because honestly, that was a really fun, not to take things wildly off topic, but it was a really fun way, like for me, someone who, like I grew up writing fan fiction, I've been writing fan fiction since I was 10 years old. I've been posting it on the internet since I was 13. I'm 25 now, for reference. And so, in all of my years of doing this, I have seen the public at large shift the mindset from fan fiction is something that we do not speak of. You do not ever openly, verbally cop to writing fanfic. You do not do that. That is cringe. That is unheard of. You do not do these things. To now, we have not only an author writing a use of her own work into her own canon published work, we also have that author who has been nominated for multiple industry leading awards and prizes standing up in interviews and openly saying, yeah, I got my start writing fan fiction. I wrote fanfic all the time. It's still on the internet. And that shift has been really neat, especially as someone who also started writing fan fiction and now makes both her fan fiction and her original works everyone else's problem. We love these to be our problem. He he he. All I do is write angst and then repeat. It's great. So we seem to have gotten into the legally mandated lock tomb segment a little early. We just couldn't wait. It was too perfect. Mm-hmm. The legally mandated lock tomb segment. <laughs> so accurate. <laughs> huh. I can't... So I have been uh, quiet because I have been trying to find the photo I took of the books. Because I remember taking a photo of them in the car on the way back from Barnes & Noble. But I, I can't find it anywhere. That's the problem with pictures. It may be worth a thousand words, but you can't do a simple text search on it. I mean, you could, I suppose, if you... God damn it! That wasn't even me. <laughs> Cam is the one out here committing audio crimes today. <laughs> We've talked a little bit about what we like in AUs. Um... Do we want to talk a little bit more about what we like in AUs? I mean, as a reader, I have thoughts. As a, Meaning as a reader, not as a writer. Because like, I know what I like in my AUs, but when I'm reading AUs, um, I, I love when the characters still feel in character. Because half of the fun for me of AUs is you, you look at a character and go, let's put that guy in some different situations. But I want it to still feel like it is indeed that guy, gender neutral, in situations. So I have a lot of fun when I'm reading like an AU of some kind, and it still feels very in character because I am here for a guy in situations time. Make no mistake. Which isn't to say, I don't want to like bash anyone who doesn't choose for whatever reason to like write things in character. That's just like a preference of mine, <laughs> to be clear. I mean, guy in situations time is always good. Uh, sometimes uh, it can be enjoyable to read one that's not quite that. Um, in fact, is more or less the opposite of taking this character 
and writing them in this particular way. I'm... Okay, Coraloran can get pretty samey, but he has made a very prolific career out of taking Jean and doing different things with him. I... He takes fandom, Jean. He doesn't take Jean. Exactly. He... It is not the character from the show. It is a different interpretation. And it... Apparently, that scratches the itch for a lot of people. It does. It is very popular and, from a technical standpoint, very well written. Um... I've I've I read a lot of his works at one point because I was discovering the concept of fan fiction at the time and didn't know there was better stuff out there. And I was like, man, these are a lot of words and it doesn't have typos. This is excellent. Very technically well executed, yes. Like that's the thing about Kurel Alaran. He is in terms of putting words on the page, well edited. I I don't really think very highly of the type of stuff he writes, because that's just me. I don't... It ain't my soup. Wrong soup. But it's pretty popular. I mean, he's really well-known within the Ruby fandom. For me, I tend to like stuff that's, uh... more superhero AU. I mean, if we're still talking about Ruby, that's not a big divergence, really. Considering not that, really. Considering um, that, that uh, uh, Magical Girl and superhero or quite closely adjacent series so so in, in terms steamed, of steamed, steamed had a realization for me the other day mm -hmm. which this happened in the ladybug thread so um and actually specifically miraculous ladybug not ladybug the ruby ship i realize i have to be clear here <laughs> right uh, <laughs> um there is a certain type of thing, and I penned it in that thread immediately because I'm like, fuck, I have been described. And we were actually talking about Shira, and then he realized, and then I realized, wait a minute, he's described everything I like about media, period. Uh, one of the reasons Shira hits, and I'm quoting here, one of the reasons Shira hits so hard is because it has many of the good elements of superhero media. Secret identity, burdened with great responsibility, forced to choose between the greater good and your own happiness. But it's actually willing to explore that, hey, isn't this kind of messed up part because it isn't actually superhero media and not burdened with its trappings. I was having like an existential crisis over that realization until like 3 a.m. Because that that describes so much about what I like about things. It's definitely a lot about what I like about Arcane, the sacrificing uh, parts of yourself for others. The uh, the Owl House Shira, as mentioned, Miraculous Ladybug, Ruby. I it is like baffling to me as to why I wasn't bigger into comics as a child, because one one of the couple of stories that I it's actually my earliest writings have that theming to them. Honestly, the reason I well that's time for when I actually get a therapist, but that type of thing is my jam. I've written superhero AUs like three or four different times. Maybe more. I read a lot of it. That's probably the tag I search the most. And as noted, I usually go a little feral over that type of thing. So how far into Animorphs have you gotten? Uh, book one. You should read more of that. I have all of the books. I have the EPUBs. They're on my computer, on my hard drive. From the sounds of things, it's something that will be very normal for you and will not burrow <laughs> into your skeleton. <laughs> wow. <laughs> or rewire your brain in any way. Mm-hmm. Ian sitting here knowing he has exposed me to a cognito hazard. I mean... <laughs> I have a I have a friend who re repeatedly does the same thing to me every every Thursday night on purpose. So, yeah, you know, it happens. Yeah, I can't wait for that friend to expose you to Ruby. I am 
I'm Again, looking forward to it. Cam, it is a show yes. that you will be very normal about. It's not I going have... to burrow into your skeleton and rewire your brain. <laughs> I have been told this. I was also told this about the Owl House, and I am very normal about it, truly. Oh, it's fine. such a shame that it ended when it did. And as as cut loose of content, like... Yeah. And I don't know, maybe this is a bit of a hot take, but I think I really would have absolutely lost my gourd with uh, some of the, like, beta concepts and stuff that was from the older versions. Like, them at high school age would have... probably would have put me in the rock tumbler. Which I'm realizing is a specific machine I remember from a very specific event. Uh, the things they put geodes in to polish. Mm -hmm. Where it's just rocks going around spinning. I actually own one. Of course it's, you do. It's a hobby that I used to be big into as a kid. And <laughs> same. I don't have mine anymore, but same. Closet. I still have a box full of polished rocks. They're very neat. But I'm actually not sure where that box is right now. I don't think I have any polished rocks. I do have a couple of rocks. I have, I think, a piece of slate in front of me. I'm not certain why. I think, you no, know, overall from AU's, the thing that I like the most is when it's... Okay, here's the thing. As a writer, I'm not super shippy. As a reader, I'm, I'm shippy. I sort the fic that I'm going to read when I look through AO3. I sort it by ship first, and then everything else, because I am very normal and well-adjusted about my Blorbos. Um, so as long as it's, like, guys in situations plus a ship I like, I'm happy as long as it feels like it's in character. Um, but I do have a soft spot for a college AU, especially now that I'm out of college, because I remember all the insane things that I did in college, and it makes me laugh, because I am who I am, and I will not change. You know, that's kind of one of the sad things for me about being almost done with college. Well, undergrad, at least. I didn't do anything that insane. No, 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 no. You, that's what grad school's for. Undergrad, you're too tired to do insane things. When you're in grad school is when you get to be unhinged. Ooh, boy. Source, I was in grad school. There's a mildly terrifying thought. That I was in grad school? Yeah, I know. I was going to say that Maya at present is not unhinged. <laughs> <laughs> I might get to play with lasers. Hmm, that concerns me. Oh boy. Me. <laughs> You're gonna burn down wherever you end up going. Just kidding. I hope not. I want to go there. <laughs> yeah. I also, I, I really way. like the professor I've spoken with uh, so far the most about. Yay. Excite. That was something that was interesting. Was like as soon as I got out of high school, high school he used nah, bitch. I was very ready to be done with high school by the end of high school, which is funny. That meant there was like about a six month at most period where I was reading high school AUs because I only started reading fan fiction during my senior year of high school. Or well, OK, only consciously. I had found fan fiction on accident before. Do we have advice for writing AUs? We've mentioned uh Keeping the guys in character. Any other advice <laughs> that we have to disseminate? I mean, I always do have thoughts, but I... I don't want to always take over the mic. <laughs> By all means. <laughs> okay. Um, I think that, yes, keeping, keeping the guys in character is a good starting point. Um... That is, and that, 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 like, looks different to everyone. I feel like a lot of times AUs get a bad rap um, because people think about AUs and are like, oh, well, it's going to be, you know, out of character and whatever. And whether it is or isn't is, quite frankly, nobody's business. And as long as you as the writer are happy, that's all that matters. Um, but, you know, I think that if you, if you desperately want to make, like, a bang in AU, I think focusing on keeping the characters as in character as possible, meaning as true to who they are, in the source material as possible is a great way to start, especially if you're, you know, taking the characters so far out of the source material, um, you know, and putting them in a modern AU where, you know, compared to like, you know, whatever they've gone through in their, you know, canon reality, you know, 
dealing with a job and taxes might be nothing or whatever. Um, you know, finding ways to to keep their character and their interpersonal relationships feel like it's, you know, canonically it canonically vibes with who they are in canon is a good start. I think the other thing to think about is their relationships. You know, we as human beings are relational creatures and we as human beings are somehow whether it's through an internal lens, external lens, or both defined by the people that we spend time with. And, you know, instead of just transporting characters into an AU setting and think about how they maneuver through it as individuals, also think about how they maneuver it in the context of their friend group or their family or their found family or their, you know, nemeses or whatever. Um, it's really fun to, at least for me, to incorporate found family elements into things because I love a good found family. And transposing that out of canon and into, you know, whatever AU universe I'm writing always helps me um, ground the main characters in the setting a bit more because in in every universe, who doesn't have friends or who doesn't have a found family or whatever? That can kind of be like the, the guiding thing. Um, and I think the third thing, which might sound counter to what I just said, um, but I see it a lot in my fanfic communities um, people stress out a lot about writing AUs, and I would encourage you, and this is easier said than done, but I would encourage you to not do that. The nice thing about AUs is it's a great representation of the two cakes meme, which went around Tumblr a lot when I was on Tumblr. If you're not familiar, um, it's it's a it's a like a like a pen drawing, a digital pen drawing. Uh, it's two panels, and in the first panel, you see someone who's just baked a cake, looking at their cake next to this like three tier wedding style cake and going oh man my cake looks so bad compared to this other person's and then the next panel is is this other little stick figure person with a knife and a fork coming up to the two cakes on the table and going heck yeah two cakes and the the thought behind the two cakes meme is you know you might look at your au and compare it to someone else's au who's like similar to yours in terms of premise and be like uh there's a so much better than mine for all these reasons but readers are just going on to ao3 and being like oh there's more than one of these au's with this premise sweet and they're diving right in um so don't don't stress out about the AUs, gang. Like, if you have an AU within your spirit that you would like to bring forth into this world, if you have guys and you have a situation you want to put those guys in, just go put those guys in situations because AU premises are so common and so popular that your fic is bound to be someone's cup of tea. And just because there's other AUs out there like yours doesn't mean you shouldn't go forth and write one of your own because you're going to have your own special sauce. And writing in AU is a time-honored fandom tradition, so why not partake? There you go. Thanks for coming to my TED Talk. Yeah, that's a lot of that was some good advice that I'm going to be incorporating, particularly uh, navigating uh, different circumstances with respect to found family and friends. I, I have a fic I'm working on that that is applicable to. There you go. But also... Yeah, don't stress about it in two cakes. I recall, uh, and I'm actually looking up to see if this has changed, there are two, like, major uh, crossovers, at least there were last I checked, between She-Ra and Destiny. One of which was one that I wrote ages and ages ago, and it looks like things haven't changed. Um, there's, like, 15 total, but there's... A lot of them are fairly short. And around the time I was finishing up one of my big ones, someone else uh, put out something that was significant. And I was like, this is pretty good. And then at one point in the notes, they're like, oh yeah, by the way, check out this person's thing. And I was like, wait, hold up, what the fuck? That's me. <laughs> I That will absolutely happen. Um... And just, I, my, I would say, just go fuck it, we ball. Do it. If you want to see it, put it out there. I, the She-Ra Destiny crossover that I've mentioned was really my first time leaping into fan fiction. I'd written something before it, but I don't really count it because it was so far removed from everything else I did. And I wasn't, it, it's almost like the, um, the discovery of magnetic levitation I didn't know enough to know to, like, be kind of anxious. Mm -hmm. I just kind of, like, went for it. 
Um, in which the case of magnetic levitation, we discovered some stuff about magnetic levitation because there was a guy who literally did not know enough to know that it should have been impossible. Because at the time, leading scientific thought was this was impossible. Turns out superconductors do really weird things with magnetic fields. <laughs> yeah. Um, and had I had I been more immersed in fan culture at the time, I, pr I might never have written that. And it's still one of the things I'm the most proud of years later and over 100,000 words later. Still, some of my big, at least in terms of what I put on AO3, some of that beginning work is stuff that I'm still the most proud of because the thoughts I put into it, um, I guess we're almost like the most pure, like the, the most distilled, as it were. So yeah, that, that's, that's my advice. Do what Cam said and also say fuck it, we ball more. Life is short, write the fanfic. That's my motto. I don't have my webcam on, so mm. you can't see me pointing at my microphone. True, though. And honestly, like, I spent so much time, for some reason, um, taking writing fanfics so seriously. And it took making, like, a burner AO3 account and just writing things um, and not telling anybody that it was me writing them um, to kind of remove that weird internal pressure from myself so like just anonymize your fic if you gotta just you know have fun with it but don't know it's, it's not it's truly it's not serious it is not that deep just have fun that's what we're all about here and, and if fandom isn't fun for you it should be so uh, please remove yourself from the situation if it's not fun for you <laughs> do good by yourselves folks mm-hmm uh, that's kind of something I always say with D and D, um, is I would rather you stop playing and not come to my campaign than come to my campaign when you're not having fun. I would rather my players enjoy themselves doing something else, even if I can't have them at the table, which I love having them, than push themselves in a way that's not fun. The same thing goes for fanfic. We don't. We don't have a lot of time. Enjoy thyself. Mm hmm. I just realized that kind of sounds a little dirty, but. If it sucks, hit the bricks. Real winners quit. <laughs> just walk out. You can leave. If it sucks, hit the bricks. Real winners quit. I have referenced that meme constantly about many things. People it's have a you know, equate meme. it with me. It's great. As soon as Ian said that, I was like, oh, we're, we're, we're doing the callback. So true, bestie. Because I, I think you mentioned that on the first time you were on the podcast. I did. <laughs> yes, the mantra against sunk costs. If it sucks, hit the bricks. Before we go, Ian, do you have any advice? I don't think I have any additional advice beyond uh, what y'all have said, which is all pretty good advice. And maybe I'll take it someday and actually write down this uh, Ruby Cyberpunk Canon Divergence AU that's been slow Ooh. cooking in the back of my mind since, like, Volume 7. Ooh. But I'm bad at taking advice, so who knows if that's ever going to happen. If it does, I will shake my brain up and down like a cardboard box. <laughs> All right. Do we have anything in the mailbag today? Unfortunately, we do not. So, if anybody listening wants to share uh, AUs that you like, hit us up. Our email address is fanfictapes at gmail.com. You can also leave a comment on our YouTube channel. And we always really appreciate if there is a new rating or review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also get in contact with us over social media. Over at Twitter, Maya runs that channel. I do. Um, our handle is at fanfictiontapes, one word, capital F, capital T. There is no dash or anything. Fan and fiction is one word. Uh, we usually put posts about episodes and updates there. Uh, so if you want to get notified about episode releases, you can do so there or through whatever your podcaster uh, is. We also... Um, I said podcaster. I think it's podcatcher, right? That's the term I always use. Yeah. 
I also shitpost on there. Sometimes. Not as often as I should. I should shitpost more. Cause problems yep. on purpose. Yeah, that would be good. But on the other hand, that would require you to spend more time on Twitter. Yeah. And that's that's not a good thing. Not nowadays, anyway. Before we go, Cam, do you have any social media or works you would like to promote to the listeners while you are here? Um, I'm on the website formerly known as Twitter under the handle Hello Cameo with two underscores, and I'm on TikTok as just Hello Cameo. That's H E L L O C A M E O. And I also have a podcast that you can listen to wherever you're listening to this one. It's called Hey Besties, it's Cam from the Internet. That's me. Ta da! <laughs> All right. Well, today's topic was AUs. Our next topic, we're sticking with the fanfic theme and going with rare ships and common ships. If you want to catch Cam the next time Cam's coming on, right now it's looking like episode 13 of season 3, The Book is Always Better. This is actually a really interesting episode to be talking about after the PGO show has started coming out. Why do you think I signed up? Why do you think I signed up, bestie? I... I think I scheduled that episode um, before I either before I heard heard about the show or more likely entirely independently and without even thinking about the show. Here's a here's a teaser of my thoughts for that one. My first exposure to the story of Percy Jackson and the Olympians was the movie that we don't talk about. And that was the first time in my life that I experienced a moment of, wow, the book is so much better. But it would not, listeners, be the last. Oh, no. That's, <laughs> that is one hell of a first encounter. Um, mm-hmm. Well, folks, I am and have been Maya. And tonight I was joined by... I don't know why I said tonight, but I was joined by... It's Cam from the internet again. Thank you for having me. Lovely to have you on, Cam. And I am our producer, Ian. Until next time, bye.